Welcome to Fit and Chips Chats, health and wellness advice for women over 40 and beyond with Amanda Thebe. This is a show full of hot topics specifically for hot women. Amanda Thebe is a force of nature for women who are experiencing menopause hell and want to start feeling healthy and fit in their 40s and beyond. Through her very frank articles, podcasts, and hilarious social media presence, she's here to help you with informative advice while making you laugh like a 20-year-old throughout. Her raging fans have called her an unstoppable inspiration. Please visit us at fitandchips.com. And now, here's your host, Amanda Thebe. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Fit and Chips Chats. I'm Amanda Thebe, and today I have on the show the Vagina Coach. Um, I'm going to let her explain a little bit more about it, but Kim has come on to the show today because I found her. We've just been trying to work out where, but it's through Instagram, and we have many mutual acquaintances. I really like Kim's approach to pelvic floor health and awareness through, and well, starting... Um, post-pregnancy all the way through to menopause, so full, covering basically the full spectrum of pelvic floor health for women. Kim holds a bachelor degree in psychology and a postgrad in health and fitness. She is a personal trainer and a bunch of other like qualifications. That's awesome. She's a, you're pretty well-rounded as it looks, <laughs> Kim. <laughs> so welcome to the show and please tell us a little bit more about yourself and where the name Vagina Coach came from, please. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. I kind of grew up with a fear and fascination with birth. I, I didn't quite understand how babies came out of vaginas and women carried on and, and were able to walk and have sex and not have everything falling out of them. And, and so I sort of grew up thinking I'm never going to have children. And then when I decided, you know, I became an adult and I got married and I decided I want to have a family. It sort of prompted in me a bunch of research. I wanted, to, first of all, I witnessed my sister-in-law. I watched her give birth and that inspired me. And I, I learned about midwifery and, and it, it sort of set me down a path of learning more about the pelvic floor. And there was a product that I used in my pregnancies called the Epino that I have been the distributor for in Canada for the last 14 years. And that was kind of the, the, the impetus, I guess. That's what I used it, had great success. I thought it was wonderful. I wanted to tell more people about it. Uh, I started then getting referrals from pelvic floor physio. So I learned about that whole world and it just sort of grew organically. And the vagina coach term came up fairly recently. Actually, I was standing, I was speaking at a mompreneur conference uh, about a year and a half or two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago. And the focus really, most of the speakers were talking about elements of business. So they were all some sort of coach. And I was later in the day on the second day and I got up and I said, okay, so we've got marketing coaches, we have productivity coaches, we have this, and now you all have a vagina coach. And it kind of just flew out. Like it was just sort of a, a, you know, catchphrase sort of thing, but then it just sort of stuck. And uh, I had always kind of you know, I, I'd been called a pelvic floor evangelist for, for a while. I was a fitness doula because I was really focused on the pregnancy world, but vagina coach really kind of summed it up because it wasn't just pregnancy that I talked about. It was the full life cycle that we have. And while I don't focus on the vagina, it brings your attention to where I want people to talk about. I want them to talk about it openly. I want it to become more normalized. And supposedly, I don't know the statistic, but a, a colleague of mine said vagina is one of the most hated words in the English vocabulary. So I'm on a mission to change that. It should be a loved word. <laughs> I was thinking of um, creating um, like a movement, like a, a yoga-based movement called a uh, vajoga. Yeah. <laughs> I love the word vagina. I, I think it. I know. I didn't do it. You can have it. It's my gift for you. <laughs> um, but I think it's really important. And I think that we've got to the point where women are, we just need to say these things. We need to get the words out. Like we call, like I said to you, call a spade a spade. Let's call a vagina a vagina. There's nothing to be ashamed about it. Yeah. And what we're finding is that um, my my listeners are in the menopause phase, and I know that's something that you, you also talk about, uh, is that the vagina starts doing things we didn't expect it to do. Mm -hmm. um, one of the misconceptions about menopause is that we um, don't have our period for 12 months and then we're in menopause and that's that. And that's not that, is it? Not, not at all. And the, we've obviously got the lead up to menopause being perimenopause. And then after that 12 um, months of like hiatus of no 
no periods were then menopausal and, and I myself am in that stage now. I'm, um, I suppose, post-menopausal and um, all of a sudden I'm having sandpaper sex with my husband, which isn't very pleasant. Um, I've already been up and down my libido in so many different ways that I never expected to happen. Um, Some vaginal atrophies happened and I don't particularly like embrace any of this. I'm not like going, woo, woo, I'm okay to talk about this. The only reason I'm doing it is because I think we need the conversation and it should be okay for other women to speak to other women and even their husbands and their doctors and their partners and to say, I'm having issues with my vagina and I want to know how to to sort of like deal with it. That's why you're on the show and I think it's so great. So I've got a trillion questions to ask you and we've only got 30 minutes. So let's try and give as much information as possible. One of the um, things that you talk about is your Kegel Mojo and I'd like you to explain what that is and what women need to know about that. Yeah, so um, I... I work with women one-on-one and I, I teach fitness professionals and movement professionals as well. And there's lots of information that we're trying to get out there, whether it's when you're working one-on-one with a person or uh, through the other professionals who will then work one-on-one with women. And there's common messages and misconceptions. And really there's, there's things that I say over and over and over. And there's also my, many of my clients who say, well, when you're not here, I need something to remind you. So I, or to remind me. So I, I created a, a program uh, that really, it has education. So it has uh, topics on, you know, menopause and all the things that we're going to be talking about today and on post childbirth and even in pregnancy, it, talking about incontinence and prolapse and kind of the main the most common triggers I think are challenges that women face. And then we have a, there's an exercise and a workout component to it. And then I brought in a bunch of guest experts as well that have, uh, you know, various expertise. We had yoga, we've got physical therapy, we have a a nurse continence advisor and a urogynecologist. And so kind of, I, I think we're, um, People get led astray because when, when you think, okay, well, I have something wrong with my vagina, you're not sure who to talk about. You usually hide it for a while. And then maybe when it gets really, really bad, then you finally go to your doctor. So that's usually the first stop. And what I'm hoping through Kegel Mojo and through kind of all the things that I do on Instagram and um, trying to get the word out there is to introduce other options, other practitioners, uh, preventive, restorative, everything so that women have choice. They know they have choice. And when they have the knowledge, they also are in a position of power because right now they're going in, they feel ashamed, they feel embarrassed, they're uncomfortable, they're, it's not easy to talk about because it hasn't been normalized. And then they have a very small appointment with a, a medical doctor, which medicine has a role, but I don't believe that it should always be the first line of defense. And so then women kind of go down, they get stuck in the medical route and then they're, maybe they're offered surgery. And, and I feel like there's so many other things that can be done first. So I was hoping by creating Kegel Mojo that it was, uh, it it would, it would give people information. It was so that people become informed and then they can make whatever choice is right for them with all of the options that are presented. Um, yeah. So let's talk about a a Kegel. You say Kegel, Kegel, and I say Kegel. It's like the whole tomato, tomato, whatever. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Let's talk about Kegels and how they've been like bastardized basically over the last 10 years and yeah. uh, what you consider to be a Kegel and what you don't consider to be a Kegel because yeah. I think that, that can be confusing. Totally. Yeah. So if, if women have heard anything about public health, usually it's go home and do your Kegels. And that's sort of been, um, you know, unless, a, and I, I mean, no disrespect to the medical community, but that's usually who people see first. And they usually are told, go home and do your kegels. They're not necessarily given proper instruction, um, or they maybe have been told that in conjunction with, say, a, a cream or a pill or a, something like that. But um, a kegel or a kegel is, it was designed by Dr. Kegel, and he saw women post childbirth having difficulty recruiting their pelvic floor. So he used a biofeedback device to help women see. So even though they maybe had lost sensation, if they could see what they were doing with a gauge, it would help. What's been lost, as you said, bastardized over time, especially with fitness, as fitness gets harder and more intense each and every year, it's the Kegel has also become, 
you know, squeeze harder and squeeze more and squeeze longer. And we forget about the letting go aspect of it. And we also forget about the lift aspect. So when people think about, most people think about a Kegel, they think about a squeeze. And what is most commonly used instead of the pelvic floor are the glutes and the inner thighs. So women think they're doing a Kegel, but they're actually not. And so I think there's a few studies and essentially over 50% of women are doing them incorrectly. Um, the best way you can, you can assess yourself. You can use your fingers. You can use a biofeedback device if you have. You can use your partner's fingers, penis, whatever. Um, but I really highly recommend that every single woman see a pelvic floor physiotherapist. That to me is the best teaching opportunity and learning opportunity that, that we have. Um, so a Kegel really is a voluntary contraction. So yes, there is a bit of a squeeze. So I imagine um, the, the one I think that resonates with the most people is a milkshake where they, if you think about using your vagina to sip a milkshake out of a straw. So there's sort of a coming together of the lips and then a sucking up, a drawing up. And then now this isn't so great with the milkshake, but there's almost like there's a letting go. So you, <laughs> you don't want to backwash really, but anyway, that's what you're essentially doing. So you're, you're, you can use a blueberry analogy as well. Grab a blueberry, pick it up, and then put it back down. And we always say to you're not making blueberry juice. You're ma you're putting the blueberry down as a whole. It doesn't have to be this massive, huge squeeze. It just needs to be a, an activation, essentially. I'm glad you spoke about the release part of it as well, because you know it's just the world we live in. Everything's like high fast paced, ultra yes. strong. And, and yeah. one of the things I understood when I um, went to see my pelvic floor physiotherapist and had a, an internal, I am actually showing it in my fingers right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those <laughs> visuals you have to do. Um, is that like my lift or my gentle squeeze was fine. My release wasn't there at all. And, and so the breathing mechanics needed to come into play. It was basically like everything was just on and I didn't know how to let go, let yeah. go at the end. And so it's the whole, the whole process and it can be confusing, but I think that tile way of learning, like it, it really makes, it's the difference I think for someone. Totally. It, it is life-changing. It really truly is life-changing. And some people come away and, and, and one of the most common things I hear is I can't believe I didn't know that about my own body and I'm 45 or I'm 50 or whatever I am. But the letting go piece is so critical. It, it, you know, I start with women in pregnancy and if the letting go isn't happening, then that can set the challenges up in birth itself. You need to be able to let go and to yield and to surrender. And if you're holding on to tension in your floor and you can't let it go, that's going to work against you in birth. And then what we find after is if women are experiencing incontinence or prolapse, there's a tendency to start, if they haven't already, there's a tendency to start developing those holding tension patterns because when you feel like something's falling out or when you're trying to hold back pee, you're, you're holding on to tension all the time. So a lot of people think that, oh, my pelvic floor is really weak. I have to do more kegels or I have to squeeze more, or lift more, or whatever. But oftentimes they need to work more on the down training, that letting go first. And it's so counter uh, intuitive, really. You don't think that that's really what you should be doing. But it, uh, it's a huge missing piece. And with the fitness being, you know, especially women, we have a tendency to want to suck and hold everything in tight. And we think that if we suck our abs in all day, that's going to strengthen our core. And that's also contributing to those non-optimal tension patterns that, that are really working against us. So a true Kegel, we really need that balance of the contract, the lift, and then the letting go. And it's the type of thing that you can practice and then it sort of becomes intuitive to the body, doesn't it? Like you don't, it's like, it's good to like, just have a, it's like everything. It's like a, mu a muscle, your brain or anything. You've got to just keep using it and using it and using it so your body doesn't forget. So you recommend doing like your three times 10 every day, right? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it depends on the person really and what they need to focus on. But there's, so the studies will say you need three sets of 10 repetitions with 10 second holes and you need to do that three times a day. And rather than the, the thing that, you know, a lot of, especially pelvic floor physios don't necessarily like a prescription of kegels because most women are doing them wrong, mm. but also they're a static exercise. They're, you're done, you know, most people do them either seated or lying down and that's not necessarily real life either. We need it to, our pelvic floor to work with us when we're moving. So I, I like some static work and I often do, you know, a set or two lying down or, or, or seated, but I, 
bring it into movement. So while I'm lifting, while I'm moving, I, I am using my pelvic floor with my breath. So usually in fitness, we say exhale on exertion. When I'm retraining somebody, so I'm, when they're having some challenges and I'm getting them to, um, you know, retraining them down that path to, to automation, you, I get them to exhale just before exertion. And, and when, as they're exhaling, they're doing that contract and lift. Yeah. And then as they inhale, they let that go again. Once and you become yeah. automated, you don't have to think about it. Like we shouldn't have to think about this, but we do because of surgery, life, pregnancies, births, sitting all the time, you know, all these things that get in the way with the, the optimal function. So, yeah. And I think that that's a, that's a really important point as well is to say that like, you know, life throws these things upon us that make things not optimal. And menopause is one of those things with those changing hormones and the, um, I hate this term vaginal atrophy. I wish I could think of a, a name of it, but the, but the, but the, it's not even the consistency, but the integrity of like, mm-hmm. the whole vagina, pelvic floor um, is compromised slightly. And I think that um, this is a time when um, the, your, your like Kegel reminders are, are really, are really helpful to women because yeah. one of the one incontinence is an, an embarrassing and hard subject to talk about, but there's some genuinely um, easy things you can do to sort of like help yourself rather than like you say, going medical. And, and it happened to me as well. Um, and I was like, Jesus, like I can fire ping pong balls out of my vagina, like a, one of the Thai ladies, but I like was peeing and I couldn't work out why. And, um, and, and it really was just the, the, the integrity and the structure and also maybe too much tension as well. All of those things. And I couldn't work it out until I actually went to see both a gynecologist and a physiotherapist pelvic floor physiotherapist who worked in tandem, which was yeah. great. Yes. Um, but one of the things is um, it, to talk about as far as the incontinence is, is when you, you, you say like practicing um, Kegel sort of on the move, you tend to have incontinence issues, either urinary urge or stress when you're on the move, not when you're lying down in bed. And right. so like when the kids jump out at you and scare you and you go, right. <laughs> pee, and there's a puddle on the floor, that's yeah. when you need to be practicing yeah. your kegels. <laughs> there's no point practicing it lying down on your bed when that's not how life is. And so, right. exactly. um, yeah, so you, you call it the sneeze, peas, I call it peasing. But that yeah. whole like sneezing, and peeing is just a really great example of how it doesn't happen like in in controlled circumstances. A sneeze normally comes when you're just not expecting it. Yeah. And so um, that, like you said, can, it really impacts someone's confidence. I mean, I don't want to be stood in the supermarket holding on to my vagina because I know a sneeze is coming. I mean, yeah. we do. Yep. And, and it's, so what type of advice can you sort of give like for that, it's just a very general question and I know it's not an easy answer, but like, yeah. so I'm, we're particularly talking about menopausal women here where there may be yeah. some sort of integrity happening. Yeah, so there is there is a new term that um, it's called genito, ur, genitourinary syndrome of menopause and it's shortened to GMS and sorry, GSM. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit of a mouthful, but what they found was, you know, there's, there's, general complaints and there was no one label that was addressing everything. So they've used this now broader term that's basically saying that there are many changes that are happening and it can affect the urinary system. It can affect the sexual health system. It can affect function, like all these things. So that's the new term. And, um, maybe makes it a little bit more easy to approach from a conversation perspective as well, rather than like you say, vaginal atrophy just sounds absolutely terrible and nobody wants to (laughs) say that their vagina, you know, you have atrophy in your vagina, but there's also a misconception that atrophy is not necessarily like a, it's well, the, the tissue starts to lose integrity and hydration, which means it starts to kind of dry up, which can narrow space. So it's not that the muscle is, is, um, shrinking per se. It's, it's the loss of, uh, like collagen, elastin tissue. The estrogen receptors are a big, huge influence there. So as the estrogen starts to decline, all of these things start to happen. And what, similar to what I tell pregnant women is pregnant women need to prepare for their recovery while they're still pregnant. And Ideally, from a menopausal perspective, if we, if we know this information well in advance, there are things we can be doing along the way. We know it's going to happen. There's, we can't 100% prevent. That's not the right word. But we can help. We, we have 
power and knowledge and we could maintain our tissue levels, our hydration in our vagina. We carry on with our exercise more diligently rather than waiting for there to be something that's a challenge that we need to look for a fix or a solution for. So um, now for somebody who's already dealing with them, I also want to stress that it is never too late. There's always change that can be made. Uh, pelvic floor physiotherapy is to me a non-negotiable. It should be standard of care for every single woman and it should be part of your annual health check-in maintenance plan, so to speak. There's a new product that I've started using called um, In the Pink Moisture Drops and they're hemp-based oil little capsules that you actually insert into your vagina at night and they are non-hormonal and um, a lot of women, even post-surgical, have had great uh, success with those. So, because one uh, of the one of the things to do, and I actually want to talk about that, is like the the integrity is the um, and the dryness that we are like sort of starting to see, like what well, well, women experience through menopause, is the pH level of the of the vagina, and so you have to be sort of really careful about what you use, right? And I know exactly, that yeah. all of those off the of on the counter products, the KY jellies and stuff, are really messing with with. Yeah bodies right so is this product this in the pink is this like like balanced with the women yes yeah yeah and there's some um, some that are high hyaluronic i always have a hard time with that word hyaluronic yeah. acid base as well that are showing um that aren't affecting that ph level as well that are helping keep it more neutral so yeah absolutely we have to be aware of all those things and not everybody can you know there are some people who respond well to the localized estrogen but not everybody can use that mm-hmm. and um so we need other options so um one of the women, um, a friend of mine, she's a nurse continence advisor, and she says, just like your face needs a moisturizer, so does your vagina. So she recommends starting now, like starting when before you're actually into menopause, if you can. But um, most of the people that I know who have used that particular product, there's other ones that they've used as well, um, are are already post menopause and they're still achieving. Um, We'll have to see if that if that's if that's available in the US. I mean, it's step by step. The hemp oil stuff is that uh, one's actually produced. It's manufactured in the US, so it is available. Oh, that's yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. And then talking about pelvic floor, like health and um, just medical, uh, like care again that really just does depend on where you're living i know it's a little bit more challenging here i've realized coming from the uk then to canada then to the us the difference in the health systems and and i know that i I know that in europe a pelvic floor physiotherapist is part of your pregnancy care yes in in france especially and and i love that it just makes me so happy yeah come come on that's my big like mission is to have that happen here i mean so come on morocco let's get with it i know yeah so so the can we talk about um I love that you use the term like vitality like the vagina's vitality when mm-hmm. it comes to sex mm-hmm. um I remember once my, like, I shouldn't say this because my mom might be listening. I remember my mom saying, oh, you know, I get a bit dry down there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, that's because you're just like so old. And <laughs> and he's me at 47. And I literally would describe sex as like sandpaper sex. It's yeah. awful. Yeah. Yep. And, and so um, what can we do? Is, what can we do to help ourselves there? Like, is, I know there's, there's products as well, but what can we do ourselves? Like, do, do things like sex toys help? Like anything that, get us like our juice is flowing I can't think for for want of a better yeah. term no it's it's right it, yeah so there it may mean that there are um you need to take you know gone are the days where it's just like okay you know especially when you have kids you've got to sometimes you got to make things happen really quick and you got you know do it on the fly and now you maybe need some more time you need more of that build up you know, those, the, the phases that you need to go through. And so you need more of a buildup and, and sex toys can definitely help. So some people use dilators even so that if they're experiencing dryness or they're feeling like there's not as much space, then they can use the dilators, which are basically progressively larger. Um, they can use their own fingers and stuff with that as well. So, but it just, yeah, as you say, get your juices flowing. Um, it might, might mean that that's what you need to do. The exercise piece of it won't necessarily address the dryness piece. Um, There's long-term moisture, which is essentially what's trying to be achieved when you're using those capsules or internal moisturizers. And then there's also short-term. So finding the right lube to use that's short-acting, but that lasts during um, during that time. There's... I know I'm talking about another product, I'm sorry, but there's another um, short-term one called Vital V, 
uh, and it's also a woman in the States who makes it. And it is amazing for a lubricant. And she also actually makes a lubricant as well, but I actually like the Vital V personally as a, as a lubricant as well, all natural based and, um, you know, non-hormonal. So, but it's about finding the right, what's going to work for you. And ideally if we have, it's a conversation that needs to happen with our partner as well, because they're, they're affected. And when it's not talked about, it can break up relationships, right? When, you know, people that, oh, they don't love me anymore. They don't want to have sex with me anymore. They don't want this. And, and the woman may feel ashamed or embarrassed or guilty and not want to talk about it. But if we need to have that, the open lines of communication there, um, speaking with a sex therapist as well, I think would definitely be helpful from a couple perspectives so that the partner is understanding of what the other is experiencing and that they, um, uh, their understanding and it's same thing as how we talk about being informed and empowered when they have the information as well, they're more understanding and they're more uh, patient and they, it can be a collaborative approach to finding something that works rather than just be like, Oh, forget it. It's frustrating, you know, just getting flustered and frustrated and giving up. Um, so and I think, I think even just looking at the way sex is, as we, as we sort of mature, it, it sort of becomes different as well. And there's different ways of approaching sex. It's not as more that it, I think sometimes like just the physical aspect of it uh, goes as much and there's just more of the emotional attachment as well. I think that that, so, so because it's, um, because of that, I think that whole conversation with your partner, male or female is just such a great one to have because, because then you're sort of still in this game together, right? Because it's some stage totally. they're, they're going to have some issues that you know yeah, exactly as well and that's, it's also along it, it all comes back to kind of what my mi- mission is really is I I want to normalize these terms I want people to talk about them openly and I want the conversation to start much earlier in life and when we if we when we do that then when we're 47 57 whatever and we're we're now with this partner, that partner has been with us. Well, I mean, there's different lengths of time you're with a partner, but we've had those conversations along the way. It's not something that's now we're having to like, Oh, you know, talk openly about my vagina. I've never had to do that before, let alone, you know, we've probably had children with this person and you know what I mean? Like there's, there's, it's an odd dynamic when you think that all of these things, I, I remember a woman, one of my clients coming in and she'd had three children and um, she'd never looked, never touched. She didn't know what the vulva was. She didn't know the anatomy. And when you think of really all the things that have happened in her life with pregnancies and births, to not know that is, is shocking in some regards. So if we can get these conversations happening earlier in life, then our sexual health, our functional health, everything, our confidence is going to be so much better. And it, it, it's not going to be an uncomfortable conversation it, it, and it, we manage it along the way that was a long answer but <laughs> no I mean, I, and I'm not in because I've said this before I mean in the, the education we have as women about our bodies it, it starts in school and it starts with puberty and it touches on pregnancy and so we sort of go into those areas with quite a lot of information so even if we don't know everything we've got a really good idea of what to expect and we never talk about menopause it's a bit boring and I always go it's, it's boring it's not sexy but yeah. it's, it's inevitable and we need, I honestly didn't have the information and I'm like knee deep in this industry and I've got all of this information around me and it's so, so we do need to start the conversation early and we need to start it like when kids are young so they just know it, they expect it. It's an expectation. Exactly. exactly. You know, it's not, it's not a shock to anyone. And so, and then back to the, like, um, the sex, I, I, I think as well, I like the sort of like, like use it or lose it type approach to sex as well. Cause like part of it is when you keep having sex, mm-hmm. you keep your vagina's health sort of intact as well. Right. Like it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think it's really important to sort of like, like consider that like another part of the, the body that needs to be constantly paid attention to. And yes, exactly. Yeah. And that also plays into like having an orgasm is a great pelvic floor workout. You know, that's, there's involuntary contraction, mm-hmm. relax and ha- relaxation happening. So, um, so masturbation as well is it's good for your health. It's good for your, your mentally, your emotional, your physical health. And, and you absolutely say use it or, or lose it. 
Um, and one other thing that I was just going to say with regards to the previous question too, is a nutrition piece that we need to look at from, um, in terms of being able to maintain the integrity of our, of our tissues. And when we're losing that collagen, are there things that, are there foods that we can be eating? Are there, uh, I know collagen supplements have become quite popular in the last few years as well. Um, even from the postpartum period, that's a lot of what I'm promoting from a recovery standpoint. And I think that if we're maintaining that through our life cycles, then that is something, again, that's going to help maintain that integrity for longer and potentially not contribute to the, the symptoms being so strong. Yeah, completely agree as well. Um, and then um, just going back to the masturbation, just because I like this subject um, and as well, I love that this is becoming just more acceptable. Like, in in conversation, I mean, I don't, mm-hmm. it always have been, but in in conversation and and like for those people who are like single at the moment, like you can still have good vaginal health with masturbation and being doing it solo. In fact, sometimes I think it's better than the, yeah. the real thing. But you know, that's yeah. just my opinion. Yeah, <laughs> nobody nobody tell my husband I said that. And then <laughs> and then there's all these um um these initiatives now, which I love the, the oh my god yes campaign. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know it's a paid product. I almost wish it wasn't. But I love I love that they're out there saying do it, and this yeah. is the best way to do it. So honestly, um, I think that if we can just lose the shame and taboo around that sort of, it's perfectly natural and normal, and it's healthy. Yes, and yes exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's and great. Um, yeah, so I think that we um, there's a lot of there are products, there are professionals, there are um, nutritionists. Pieces. There's there's many. It, it needs to be a collaborative approach. There's I don't ever really believe that there's a one stop shop that, um, that is the perfect remedy for everybody. I think you need to kind of, and it takes a bit of work, but you need to be proactive and you need to be, um, you need to take charge of your own health. And, uh, there's another, like, there's a lot of, um, uh, technology now being brought into women's health with regards to lasers or radio frequency devices, that type of thing that are also helping with, um, dryness and, um, and atrophy and, you know, all that, or the, the GSM. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. So I think that it, it's just, as we're doing now, we're, we're, the conversation started and at least if it can inspire somebody to look elsewhere, go beyond what is considered the norm of, you know, I need, I'm going to need surgery or I need to have a drug for this. That should be your last resort. And it, and it can absolutely play a role and it can absolutely change lives when, when done correctly and when done, when managed well. But I, I, I want to make sure that women have have gone all those other routes first and looked at all of the other options before they go there and they're going there informed. Yeah, that's great. Well, Kim, we're out of time. That was quick. (laughs) That was was a quick conversation. (laughs) I know, but there was so much we could talk about, but thank you for sort of reinforcing everything that I believe in anyway. I knew that we, this would be the type of conversation that we would have and and it's going to be so useful for women. And I think, like you say, um, it can't be one person that helps you. There's so many of us out there that are just really wanting to talk about, well, for me, particularly about menopause and all of our health around it. You just keep Getting talking inside of the box as you as you would say <laughs> about about the vagina. I have so many vagina jokes. Honestly, <laughs> come to me next time you want to. I love. <laughs> we'll do some marketing together. <laughs> do some vaginal marketing. Um, so you can find Kim um, on Instagram at the. You are the vagina coach. Is yeah, just your, vagina coach. Yep. Yeah. And ac- actually, everywhere you are, vagina coach. But you're I'm a vagina co- coach. Yep. Vagina coach.com, vagina coach on Instagram. And the only one is Facebook because Facebook doesn't like those taboo words. Oh, uh, you're kidding me. No, yeah. really? Yeah. So I'm still working on that <sighs> one. But uh, yeah, so I have, there's two businesses I have. Pelvian and Wellness is one, which is vagina coach.com, and Belly Zinc is another one that's really focused on the pregnancy world. But yeah, vagina coach, just that's basically where you'll find me, especially on Instagram. It's been more time there. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. That was very helpful. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you having me. And that's the end of today's podcast. And please tune in next week for some more guests. Take care. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the show. For more information on the services offered by Amanda, please head over to her website at fitandchips.com. That's F-I-T-N-C-H-I-P-S dot com. 
or her Fits and Chips Facebook page. Leave a comment and she promises to respond to all questions. The views and advice expressed by Amanda Thebe are not a substitute for conventional medical service. No information here should be interpreted as a medical diagnosis, treatment or prevention of any disease. If in any doubt, always contact your healthcare provider.